Welcome back to Inclusive Design 24 2023. Brought to you in partnership with our platinum sponsors, Google and Intopia, and our gold supporters, Barrier Break and Tetralogical. You can follow us on Mastodon. And if you have questions for the presenters, post them using the ID24 hashtag or post them in the YouTube chat for our Q&A at the end of the session. A reminder that ID24 is a respectful community and you can find our code of conduct on the Inclusive Design 24 website. I am particularly tickled to be joined by Mark, who is my guest host today. So um, Mark, over to you. Hello. Uh, yeah, welcome back. This is my third session and I'm delighted to welcome not one speaker, but two. And uh, they, um guess, will wake you up with their talk and I just say like, let's get mental. Your stage, Carrie Joe and Albert. Thank you, Mark, uh, for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, uh, thank you for inviting us to speak for Inclusive Design 24. Uh, our topic is about mental health. However, uh, ironically, I think I'm going through some anxiety attack right now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But uh, seriously, though, yeah, I had to take some pills. But um, I think that there's a lot that we are going to cover. And it's a really important uh, topic because we haven't really discussed much about uh, mental health and accessibility, digital accessibility. So um, yeah, let's begin. Um, so uh, today we are gonna talk about uh, digital intersectionality between uh, digital accessibility and uh, mental health. Um, and just to know, just just know that um, this will not only be applicable for users with chronic mental health conditions, but it will eventually be helpful for all users. Um, and to begin our uh, contents um, presentation, we are going to share a little bit about our personal journey to build some empathy. Um, oh, can you go? And. Um, we are going to also share um, where are we in terms of uh, global mental health? Uh, what's the state uh, of mental health? Uh, then we'll talk about some stigmas, right? Um, around mental health, invisible disabilities, visible disabilities, right? Um, and then we'll talk about usability and accessibility issues and the suggestions that we came up with. Um, and at the end, we also want to talk about hiring and equitable workplace if we have enough time. Um, so next slide. Um, I'm Albert Kim. Um, I'm a consultant uh, working for Accessibility Innovation. It's a company that I founded. Um, the goal of this Accessibility Innovation is to discuss and try to uh, talk about um, topics that were traditionally not covered in digital accessibility, whether it is certain disabilities like invisible disabilities, neurodiversity, mental health, cognitive learning disabilities, intersectionality and disability, or emerging technologies like AR, XR. So uh, that's why the name goes Accessibility Innovation. And um, uh, the goal of the uh, uh, the mission is to um, make the shift to left, so make reactive um, uh, in reactive solution to be more proactive solution from the beginning, from the brainstorming phase. Um, I also run um, a nonprofit organization, 501c3 nonprofit organization, Accessibility Next Gen. Uh, it's a peer support community to grow accessibility champions and the next generation of leaders in our field. Uh, we have Slack and uh, Meetup um, in total over 1,000 uh, members all over the world, uh, virtual, remote, US, Canada, Nigeria, Ghana, Sweden, Germany, Japan. Um, we hosted a mentorship program and paired 124 mentors matched with 353 mentees. Uh, we also have study groups and things like that. Um, and I'm also a W3C invited expert uh, working on uh, building accessibility guidelines like the uh, WCAG that we we know. Um, 
And in particular, I'm interested, I work with the Cognitive and Learning Disabilities Task Force to build accessibility guidelines for users with, in, uh, with uh, neurodivergent users. Um, and also I work with the mental health subgroup to research what are some possible accessibility guidelines that could help uh, users with chronic mental health conditions. Um, so in terms of uh, my disability, uh, I'm, I'm disclosing my disability here. Um, I have OCD, right? And um, a lot of people think that OCD is about, oh, like, you know, super clean or organized. Oh, do you wash your hands like five times uh, every, every second or whatever? But actually, OCD is a lot more than just being clean, right? Um, my OCD is about completion. Um, so it can apply for every sector of life. For example, when I talk, uh, I have the compulsion to completely finish, uh, completely confess everything that I want to say uh, on a certain topic that I'm addressing. Or when I'm researching a topic, uh, I have a compulsion to research completely about that topic, um, even if it's irrational. Um, and that applies to um, physical space as well. Um, and, and if I don't have that, if I don't uh, follow that compulsion, then I get anxiety. So um, I have anxiety, uh, generalized anxiety disorder as well. Um, and I get, uh, I have ADHD as well, um, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder. Um, and whenever I research different topics, then I get sidetracked as well um, into different topics. And um, uh, I miss uh, things that um, like that I just remember, but I miss it. Um, and because of my PTSD, um, I, I have a, a sensitive, um, sensitive, I, I'm very sensitive and I'm always on alert mode in social settings. So I actually prefer virtual setting like this than uh, in in-person meetings. Um, I get very sensitive. Um, so it's very hard for me to focus in a group uh, environment. Um, and I also have a reading comprehension disorder. Um, so that is because I read uh, passages letter by letter. So uh, I cannot remember by the time I finished one page what I read, right? So um, that's another one. Um, and overall, because of all these um, influences of the uh, mental health diagnosis um, that I have in my daily life, um, I, uh, I, I have a very low self-esteem. I, I struggled a lot with low self-esteem and I isolated myself from outside world, uh, tr had a lot of lone time and was very depressed. Um, and yeah, so those are my diagnoses. It's, it's a lot, but um, yeah, that's that's uh, I, I'm fully disclosing it. Thank you so much, Albert. I'm Carrie Jo Wise. I'm a senior accessibility engineer at Pearson. Uh, I have a master's in assistive technology from CSUN. I graduated in 2020. Um, I am a former teacher of the blind. I I love teaching Braille and assistive technology to young learners. Um, and I am a mom and a dog mom. I have a eight-year-old daughter and a and two dogs. I have generalized anxiety disorder. That was my primary diagnosis as a child. Um, as I got older, I went through some traumatic things and I have PTSD. I also have reverse slope hearing loss. Um, it's genetic. So my mother and my grandfather both have the same kind of hearing loss. It's the rarest kind of hearing loss. So normally when people are losing their hearing due to like age-related hearing loss, you lose the high sounds. <clears throat> but I actually hear high sounds better than most people, but then low sounds, I don't hear those very well at all. And it can really cause some problems. Um, like there's certain letters that I just don't hear well. And so it can uh, really get things mixed up and confusing. Uh, 
I really prefer uh, a lot of times if I'm discussing things in text is better just because I can read really well, really well and really understand that. But listening comprehension is not great. Um, I'm a glass child. When I was growing up, my little brother had significant uh, multiple disabilities. He's in a wheelchair. Um, he doesn't, he's nonverbal. So uh, I got to, as a child, observe and advocate for my brother and his uh his humanity and rights. And I'm also queer. So that's just a little bit about me I'd like to share. Thank you. Um, so what is the state of global mental health right now? We're gonna talk about some statistics of occurrence of mental health disabilities, uh, the stigma related to disabilities and kind of break that down and talk about some usability and accessibility issues and solutions for people with mental health diagnoses. Uh, currently, the state of global mental health, uh, about one in five adults in the United States have uh, some kind of mental health diagnoses, so about 20%. Uh, those statistics really vary throughout the world from country to country. Um, I, think it more has to do with people's access to diagnoses and treatment than really the actual incidence of these kinds of disabilities. I would guess that pretty much worldwide is about the same. It's just about how much stigma there is in your particular culture to get that kind of treatment and diagnoses. Um, there's about 52.9 million people in 2020 that had a, this kind of type of diagnosis. So it is common. It's also more common to see higher rates of mental health issues in an area which has suffered a hazardous event, like maybe New York after the 9-11 tax or uh, you know, natural disasters, earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, those kinds of things can really contribute to uh, mental health diagnoses. There's been a significant in increase recently we saw a big increase during the pandemic. In the first year, there was a 25% increase in these type of diagnoses. Everyone was, you know, shut in their homes and really had a difficult time. And so these issues were probably there already, but were exacerbated by the situation. Uh, and about 58% of people from 18 to 29 reported uh, experiencing high levels of psychological distress. As far as treatment, only about half of people receive treatment. A lot of that's due to the stigma related to getting treatment. Um, a lot of people are you know, told you just need to work on yourself, your own discipline, your own diet, or exercise, instead of getting actual medication and treatment and therapy. Also, it's really expensive. Uh, medical treatment is expensive the world over. Uh, and the poverty can have a really big effect on being able to not not being able to get any kind of treatment. There's also a lack of professionals. It's often hard to find good professionals, and if you can find a good professional, being able to get scheduled is a uh, can be quite a challenge. This is a graph uh, showing the prevalence in 2020 of uh, mental illness among USA adults. <clears throat> we see that um, overall it's about 21%. Females, it's 25%. Males, it's 15%. Um, for the age ranges, you can see at 18 to 25, it's the highest at 30%, going down to 26 to 49 age range, there's only 25%. Um, and then it, at 50 plus, it's 14%. Uh, once again, I don't think that this is necessarily accurate as far as how many people 50 years and older, only 15% have a mental illness. I think as time has gone on, it's become more acceptable to discuss these kinds of things and to reach treatment and kind of diagnoses. We also see disparities in different uh, groups, different racial groups, ethnic groups. There's different rates of uh, disability as well there for mental illness with the highest and, being for people with two or more races. Yeah, go ahead, Albert. Yeah, and I just wanted to add that for me, the most shocking statistics that I saw was um, 
according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, more than four in 10 students, so 42% felt persistently sad or hopeless and nearly one third experienced poor mental health and one in five students seriously considered attempting suicide. Um, and that's no wonder why uh, suicide is the second leading cause of death in adolescents uh, aged 15 to 19. It's, a th it's not, you know, cancer or anything else, but it's, it's the suicide. Um, and this gets worse for teenage girls. So among girls, 30%, so one in three uh, teenage girls said that they seriously considered attempting suicide. And then um, it, that's the double the rate among boys and um, up almost 60% from a decade ago. So, um, and and a, a lot of them, uh, a lot, most of the diagnoses, uh, most popular uh, were the anxiety um, and depression. And, um, it, Co coincidentally, I know that uh, correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation, but um, coincidentally, actually, the uh, the use of uh, social media as well as um, access to uh, mobile uh, apps and mobile uh, technologies, um, the age of uh, people getting access has also gotten uh, much earlier, um, and. Um, um, and and I think you know comparing you know uh, themselves to other people on social media and things like that can also um, have a really harsh impact, uh, right? In terms of mental health. Um, anyways, yeah. Uh, let's go ahead. There's a lot of stigma around mental health diagnoses in general. A lot of times we see inaccurate portrayal in popular media. Think of shows like ER and someone comes in with a mental health diagnosis and they're dirty and they're violent and it's really scary. Um, you know, that, that's not really how most people with mental health diagnosis are. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but that's not typical. And it really exacerbates the already negative stigma around mental health diagnoses. There's a lot of casual jokes and like colloquial expressions like, oh, I, I'm just so crazy today. Or, oh, I, my OCD, I had to organize my bedroom. You know, those, those aren't real mental health issues. And like just kind of making light of them is, can really be damaging to people with these actual diagnoses. Additionally, you can see a lot of like inspirational porn kind of things or uh, where you're just kind of making the the person with a disability is just like, oh, you've overcome so much and you're just so amazing. And that's also not realistic or helpful. Um, there's also a lot of like motivational self-help quotes about like just pulling yourself up um, and really, uh, you know, building yourself up, not not that it's a diagnosis or a disability that you're gonna deal with your whole life and there's gonna be challenges. There's a lot of feeling in, in different cultures that it's not real. You don't really have this, it's not a real disability. It's just all in your head and you can overcome it through structure or calendars or eating better, exercising, those kinds of things. Um, <clears throat> that that these diagnoses aren't really disabilities. It's just a character flaw or a weakness. So if you were just, you know, more determined or focused, or you just, you know, really put yourself uh, to like put more pressure on yourself, you would be able to overcome this kind of diagnosis. Additionally, if someone has this diagnosis and they're getting any kind of accommodation, whether it's in school or at work, um, it's kind of viewed as cheating, like you're getting a, a upper hand that you don't really need and that you're getting an advantage that you shouldn't have. Hmm. When really accommodations are just leveling the playing field, giving a, a slight um, equalization factor, you know, not, not at all giving a, a hand up. And I just wanted to add that... Um... So also in the media, like a lot of times uh, when mental health is brought up, it's about like a, you know, serial killer or like a mass murderer, a mass shooter. And that's when we uh, talk about, uh, 
mental health a lot, but mental health is a lot more than just that, right? Um, and um, and and so it it kind of um, stops people from actually seeking for uh, uh, therapy and treatment. Um, so they rely on street drugs. Uh, so there's a lot of problems with street drugs among um, people who are going through uh, mental health um, problems. And um, also, um, I think that the, there's a perception towards uh, that it's the character flaw. It's, it's, it's the weak character. So a lot of self-help books uh, emphasize, oh, it's all about discipline. It's the willpower. Well, yeah, like, you know, there's some importance to those things as well. But I think that our society nurtures tolerating mental illness. And uh, I think it's, 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 it's important to say now that it's okay to be not okay. And it's healthy to cry, right? Um, and I'm not taking advantage of uh, my accommodation, um, right? I'm not trying to take an advantage um, or a cheat by getting accommodations for my mental health uh, conditions. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, share those things. And um, because I hear in my daily life, um, uh, like, you know, on TV, when like uh, I literally saw on a late night TV show, uh, the host uh, says to the guest, when the guest is trying to organize some uh, like a cup on the table, oh, you must have OCD, like right away. And I was like, oh, a little, mm, I don't know about that, you know, <laughs> like, um, so yeah, I get that a lot of times and I think it's not really helping, uh, but actually uh, underestimates the actual struggle that people who are going through mental health conditions. So nobody now takes you, ser takes me seriously anymore, right? If I say OCD, I have OCD. So as far as stigma around disabilities, it is slightly different depending on the type or group of disabilities you fall into, whether it's a, an invisible disability or a non-apparent disability. Um, a lot of times the stigma is more around like your disability doesn't exist or it doesn't really have an impact on you because other people cannot like visually observe physical characteristics surrounding that kind of disability. Um, a lot of times there's a comments like you look fine to me I don't see anything so it's got to be just you know you're just blowing things out of proportion over over exaggerating um it's all in your head so like uh saying that it's not actual actually a, a disability that it's just you know something that you've created because you're too stressed about something um telling people, giving people advice. Oh, you don't need to go to therapy or take those pills. Stop taking those pills. You just need to exercise or stop eating food dyes. Um, that, that's, I think, really big right now, especially with children um, saying that they don't have some kind of diagnosis like ADHD. They just need to not have food dyes, which, you know, can affect people. But these diagnoses are real and not likely to be solved by just personal behaviors like diet or exercise. Um, saying it's all about a, di a discipline, you just need to, you know, focus on yourself, have schedules, um, and, and get um, to the point where you're, you're overcoming this. An underestimation of needs. So um, just, you know, not saying, oh, well, you don't need captions or that kind of stuff. Cause like, it seems like you hear fine to me, uh, you know, that that's not really how it works. And like another person doesn't get to decide the, the impact of your disability. There's a lot of stigma around disability. It's, it, and it can be internalized. Uh, <laughs> people blame themselves for their issues instead of realizing that it's not really the disability that's causing an issue, but an, an inaccessible environment around them. Um, oftentimes it's hard to tell people about a, di a diagnosis like this. They, they call them invisible or non-apparent, but I do think for me, if I don't disclose these things, people do notice things that I don't hear well. And I ask for repeats a lot, um, that, you know, I have panic attacks. That's a thing. Uh, and so if I, if I don't discuss, discuss my diagnosis, I, I'm really putting myself at a disadvantage because people are less 
likely to repeat for me or know that they need to speak loudly and clearly um, that I may, you know, I'm not being difficult if I'm having a hard time in the morning. I probably didn't sleep well because it's it's hard for me to sleep. Um, so I think that's really important is, is turning away from that internalization of ableism and uh, understanding that, you know, a person can be amazing and still have these kinds of disabilities. Um, and people may even forego medical services because of the stigma, because they're hearing from their friends and family, you don't need medication, you don't need therapy, you need, you know, a calendar and, to, and some kind of self-discipline. Um, the stigma may lead to them hiding and suffering in silence, which is not what we want for anyone, but especially people with mental health diagnoses. Um, the stigma surrounding visible disabilities is a little bit different. I, I think that specifically it's more focused on like their hum humanity um, instead of their disability. Uh, for example, things like they're not, people don't speak to them. They'll speak to whoever they're with, um, asking for like orders at restaurants or just like general conversation. Um, there's an automatic ex example or an automatic assumption of like, this is such a tragedy and it's so sad and like, just kind of like making it like it's, um, like it's terrible, like it's not expected. Um, there's a lot of feeling that people shouldn't, with obvious disabilities, shouldn't really be in public spaces, um, that they should just stay home. They're more likely to be victims of hate crimes or sexual violence, which I actually think is true for both types of disabilities. Um, speaking of wheelchairs is like being confined to a wheelchair. When a, when a wheelchair really like gives you the freedom and the ability to stay mobile yourself and it's a mobility aid and it's not any kind of hinderment, it's an advancement. Seeing, uh, seeing disability as a sickness that needs to be cured, that, oh, you must be in constant pain. That isn't true for most people with disabilities. There might be an episode like that or maybe initially after some kind of accident, but typically people with disabilities are leading whole, healthy, happy lives. Um, and then there's also a view that people with disabilities are a liability uh, in the workplace or as, uh, in, as uh, patrons as well, like getting get sued by people with disabilities. Um, <laughs> so this may lead to people trying to either conceal their assistive technology devices like hearing aids or mobility devices you know, not wanting to use a walker or a cane because it's embarrassing. Um, they don't want to have that kind of negative stigma reaction by people around them. Um, so the reason why we talk so much about this stigma and uh, all the um, personal stories and experiences is because we can we can teach only so much about technical things, right? We cannot give solutions for every design problems. Um, at the end of the day, each designers and developers have to think on their own uh, uh, to determine, um, to empathize with their users, right? So uh, I hope that this actually, uh, what we shared helps you um, kind of empathize with the uh, users who have chronic uh, mental health conditions. Um, and in, in terms of usability and accessibility issues, I'd like to give some examples of some challenges, right? Uh, we used to, uh, I think that we used to think of provocative, uh, fancy, shiny designs that attract attention, right, uh, from, from people as, as the good design. Uh, we need to attract them. We, we need to uh, buy their attention, you know. Um, but that is actually not really a neural inclusive design, right? because it drains the cognitive energy. Um, and I think that we uh, lack um, appreciating um, our, co uh, user, our users' cognitive energy as a limited resource, like time and money that users are spending, right? So everyone, uh, we, we have a limited amount of uh, cognitive energy 
Um, and brain is the most expensive organ, right? It, it, it consumes most amount of calories, single organ that consumes the most amount of calories. Um, so would you want your users to burn their energy out uh, like, and then never come back or exhausted? Oftentimes the co most common reaction uh, of, of inaccessible or uh, unusable uh, designs uh, for users with chronic mental health conditions is that they completely avoid it. They don't want to come back anymore. Um, and that's not really a good design, right? Um, we want we want designs to be more comfortable, intuitive, and we want to and that will eventually lead into higher retention rate. So um, how do we then uh, you know think about cognitive energy of our users? For example, let me give you an example. Um, if we before signing up for uh, creating an account for for a web page for an app, what if there's a preview or like a peak view of the app without me having to log in or sign up, right? Um, so that I can take a look uh, uh, before I decide to sign up, or also being able to multi-select different options, right? Or if there's a search engine, um, if there's a, a search bar, then um, uh, is there filters, right? Is there uh, uh, filters and does the search bar actually work? Um, or does it just show everything, right? Um, or does it end up uh, giving you endless scroll of so many items and overload you with so much information that, you know, now it's it's very hard for you to make a decision. Um, that's not really a neuroinclusive design. A neuroinclusive design is a, a design that thinks about the cognitive energy, a cognitive limited cognitive energy of our users as a, a limited resource, and um, uh, it demands less cognitive effort from users. Um, and um, so. Having said that, I know um, even for neuro, like neuro inclusive designs are not just good for you know users with uh, chronic mental health conditions, right? Um, but it is especially helpful because a lot of uh, users who have who go through chronic mental health conditions, we are already going through a lot, uh, spending a lot of emotional mental energy in a daily on a daily basis. So we don't really have enough of that resource. It's a very scarce resource for those partic that particular pool of users, right? Um, but um, it, these neuroinclusive designs are actually helpful for um, all users, not just the users with chronic mental health conditions, right? Um, if if the page has a good structure, uh, easy navigation, organized, uh, consistent design and layout, um, it also helps blind users. Uh, navigate much better, right? Uh, with their screen readers, um, and semantic structure is also helpful for uh, search engine optimization. So um, it's not just for users with chronic mental health conditions. Um, and um, following these can also help you meet the WCAG 2.1 AA standard as well. I know that that's, but that is a only the beginning, not the end goal, right? But but I know that we, uh, in reality, in our, our, our daily job, we think about that a lot. Uh, it's kind of important in our job. So, uh, you know, when we, uh, when we uh, pursue neuroinclusive design, we are actually meeting some of the uh, uh, success criteria in from the WCAG as well. Um, and so designs that don't drain attention, um, also, another thing is, have you ever had an incident where like you are lying down uh, at night and just like, you know, uh, browsing uh, on your cell phone and um, your phone is has a dark mode turned on and then suddenly uh, you go to a certain app and the uh, entire uh, screen is white or like a very bright color and you get surprised. Oh, my God, like that's so bright, you know, like. Like that's not really a good design. Personally, I think that um, uh, uh, being able to adapt to dark mode. Um, also, for me, um, 
I, I use actually dark mode and I tint my display and I reduce, I use also, there's an um, accessibility setting called reduce white color. Um, I do all those settings 24 hours, seven days, 365 days, because that uh, helps reduce the stimulation that I get from, from the um, uh, light sources, right? Um, or a sudden unexpected noise or sound right? Very provocative and it drains the uh, energy from uh, people and users. And that's not really a good design. Um, next slide. So I've already mentioned a lot of uh, some suggestions, but um, I think most importantly, clear, concise information uh, really helps. And and how, how do we... Um, um, then do that. Um, how do we convey clear, concise information if there's a lot of uh, uh, information to convey? Um, for example, you can have a summary, right? You can have a summary at the end of the uh, page um, to uh, summarize everything that you wrote uh, in, in a blog, or you could also have a table of contents, right? Um, uh, with headings, different uh, structures, uh, subheadings and things like that. Um, also, you could have uh, like a takeaways, like a three points, three three takeaway points, right? Um, so that uh, you, users are able to understand your content uh, without having to read everything, um, right? Less, as I was mentioning before, less uh, cognitive energy drain, right? Um, simple, intuitive, minimalistic design clear, concise information, um, semantic HTML with headings and organized structure, consistent overall pattern and interactions, labeling, targets, uh, layout, and functionality. Um, ability, uh, I think what is um, uh, the kind of uh, suggestion that I wanna make um, if I were to summarize is that, um, I think traditionally we designers and developers have decided what the best user experience is going to be for the user. But um, I don't think that that's a, uh, uh, that's a, that's, that's the right way to go moving forward because there's no one size fits all. Um, and every user is different. Uh, and if we start thinking about users with chronic mental health conditions or neurodivergent users or users uh, who are blind or deaf, um, then we need to start thinking about how do we, like, how do we even define what the best user experience is, is for them, right? Um, then personally, I think it's, it's um, at, in that situation, I think um, what's really important is giving options and choices to users. For example, if the user doesn't want to uh, uh, does, uh, doesn't want to um, come across uh, any contents that provoke their PTSD, right, trigger their PTSD, uh, do they have the option, right? If they are not even given an option, right, um, to filter such content, um, then it's not. Uh, then they don't. They then they don't even have a choice, right? So. Um, or content filters, right? I think the next slide, yeah. So like if, it, if it, there's a sensitive content, do I get a choice whether or not I wanna look at that content, right? Um, or do I want my history to actually customize the algorithm and the feed for me? Like, or can I opt it out? Um, things like that, like giving choices to users, I think is very important. Um, uh, rather than defining what the best user experience is going to be for everyone, right? Um, so, and then next slide. Yeah, as I was mentioning, filters, it's uh, like being able to uh, select multi-filters, right? Um, being able, uh, Because nowadays, when you go to, a, for example, e-commerce site, there are way too many items. Like I have to scroll, like there are way too many items. The problem is too many options, not too, too uh, less options, right? So um, being able to filter um, uh, is, is very important. Um, and also having, rather than endless scrolling, as I was mentioning, 
um, having uh, separating them by pages, and I can choose um, how many items I want to see in each page, for example, or can I sort them by price or uh, certain relevance? But giving these are all enabling uh, users to uh, spend less of their cognitive energy and effort and, and uh, more smoothly uh, navigate and, uh, um, and thus making designs more accessible for uh, users with chronic mental health conditions. Um, now we're going to discuss a little bit about inclusive hiring and how um, you can hire more people with mental disabilities, mental health disabilities. First of all, why would you want to hire more people with mental health disabilities? We have a lot of strength. Um, this applies for a lot of people with neurodiversity. Um, we're very empathetic. We know what it's like to struggle. Uh, we have strong perseverance. We've been through things and come out and not given up. Uh, we're very creative. Many, many people with neurodiversity think th about things differently, and that can be a real strength for a company. <laughs> um, it, when we're brainstorming, we're good at brainstorming ideas, and once again, bringing a different perspective to a discussion that someone else might not bring up. Uh, <laughs> Ownership, we have a strong ownership of our work and um, our, our abilities. We're self-aware, we know our strengths. We also know our, you know, where we, areas where we may need some more assistance and are not afraid to reach out for that assistance. And um, we're very responsible. It's not very likely that uh, someone with a, a mental health disability is not going to meet their responsibilities. Uh, we take those very seriously. And I think um, the course, reason is, oh, sorry about that. And okay. I think the reason is that uh, people with chronic mental health conditions, we are so accustomed to uh, thinking about how other people think about us, right? Because, uh, and, and they're, um, how they stare at me, you know? So because, because of that, I think I um I think people with chronic mental health uh, conditions or neurodivergent candidates will try their best to prove that they are not worthless and they you know shouldn't be excluded, right? They hate the feeling of wor being worthless or excluded. They want to be part of the team. So I think that's why um, they put extra effort. They can be very responsible uh, in their job. Um, so according to a recent uh, article by the Harvard Business Review, uh, they discussed the val value of people with disabilities to a company and that um, the inclusion of people with disabilities can lead to a real competitable, competitive advantage and long-term profitability. Um, really, when you ha have a large group of uh, employees, you're going to have people who with disabilities. It's there's no way to get around it. It's part of the human experience. Um, also, you may hire someone that doesn't have any disabilities and they'll develop them. By the age of 65, most people over half ha do have some kind of disability. Um, and so if your company um, does a good job of uh, designing their uh, hiring and employment practices to for people with disabilities, then they're more likely to benefit all people, all employees. Uh, currently, the rate of employment for people with disabilities is at 41%, which is not specific to mental health diagnoses, but just in general. Um, and this is actually the highest it's ever been since they've been tracking. Um, we saw a significant improvement during the pandemic with remote work. That's very beneficial to people with different kinds of disabilities. Um, and I really hope that as offices are pushing to go back into the office, they're taking that into consideration that um, that a lot of times remote work is an accommodation and um, really beneficial and it doesn't, and people are shown that when they are working remotely to be just as effective, um, get work done, 
be and be valuable employees. If you'd like to read more about that Harvard Business Review article, I really recommend it. And on our last slide, there's a link to it. Um, really good information in there. So um, how do we build an equitable workplace? Um, well, first of all, um, next slide, actually. Um, we need to know that uh, our colleagues or our teammates or people um, we don't fake a mental illness. That's the first thing that we uh, we all should know. We actually fake being okay, right? Uh, often their biggest fear is being a burden. So they smile when they are going through hell. Then say, um, I'm busy when having a mental breakdown. They say that they are okay when they are actually not. So if someone does reach out, please don't perceive it as an attention seeking and dismiss them. It's because they really need support, right? And um, in terms of uh, best practices of inclusive hiring, provide all applicants with interview questions or topics prior to interview, D fully uh, transparency, fully disclose. Um, if the, and ask rather than assume, right? Um, because you can, like for example, oh, I I I have ADHD, so I'm I kind of know what that that candidate needs. No, that's not true because um, every ADHD, every person is different, and uh, their coping mechanism may be different as well, right? So ask rather than assume, um, and um, also create a simple process from application to onboarding. I feel like nowadays there's just so many; uh, it can become a barrier in a way, right? You have on your company website mission as diversity inclusion, but then your application process is, is, is a barrier for, you know, neurodivergent candidates. That's not really inclusive. Um, and when, after the candidates are um, hired, um, rather than throwing all the resources at them and, hey, you know, these are all the softwares that we use, try checking them out. And you know, try setting up meetings with you know uh, our our teammates and just get to know them, rather than just doing that because it's a because they are first they are uh, in a new environment, right? Especially for neurodivergent um, employees, I think it's important to give them guided step by step onboarding process together. Hey, let's walk th walk through this together. Hey, uh, let me show you uh, how we use this software. Um, there's these tools and, and going step by step rather than just throwing all the resources at them. Um, and another emphasis I wanted to do, make is uh, having recordings and documentation available is um, it's not just for watching and reading right later, but also it can relieve anxiety um, that I have to catch every single thing in one sitting, right? Um, so, oh, like if in the back of my mind, because there's a recording and documentation available later, oh, I can come back and uh, read them uh, if there's anything that I missed, right? So I think that's really a basic um, thing. Um, being flexible uh, um, and no sudden surprises, like number of attendees in interview, for example, was, it was supposed to be like, you know, one-on-one -on -one or two-to-one, but suddenly, you know, 15 all team team uh, members came and then, you know, interviewing. That's overwhelming, right? Uh, no surprises. And lastly, uh, please know that positive feedback is, uh, negative feedback is never a long-term sustainable solution. Uh, positive feedback is. So I think that, you know, we have to keep in mind uh, to use positive feedback more um, in, in the workplace. So uh, thank you for uh, watching our presentation. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback. Um, so, you know, please uh, email us or reach out to us via LinkedIn and then share what you thought of our presentation. Uh, also, if you need a slide, uh, you know, uh, please ask. We are more than happy to uh, share them. Feel free to email me and then I'll share the slides as well. Um, we also, uh, I, I also um, 
to design review, um, auditing, testing, consulting, training, and speaking. So if there is anyone who want to hear more about this content, uh, I'd love to uh, help as well. Thanks so much, Albert. What, what a great presentation. I was really glad to work on this with you. Um, like you said, if you guys want to reach out to us, we've got our email addresses and our LinkedIn profiles on here. And there are events coming up um, in the next year that you can uh, book different speakers like uh, for Pro Disability Pride in July, Death Awareness is this month, September. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you both, Albert and Carrie Jo. I appreciate that. That was a great talk. Uh, Mark, we are very tight on time. Do we have yes, anything we uh, to throw at them? Uh, just a few very positive comments uh, on uh, YouTube, for example, uh, resonating with you, what you said. I myself like uh, can completely resonate to say what you just said, uh, Albert, about like positive feedback is really important. Uh, that would make social media so much better also, right? Like to think about and write, write, write the stuff that you want to complain about, maybe in a positive feedback way, <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely true. Um, apart from that, I think uh, you're right, Adrian, we are pretty short in time. Okay. Well, thank you again, both uh, to our viewers. Thank you so much. You... I'm sorry? Thank you so much. I said oh. like to, to them both. <laughs> I went and hid my camera like a fool. Um, if you <laughs> like this session, hit that YouTube like button. And uh, don't forget, you can subscribe to youtube.com slash inclusive design 24 to be kept in the loop on our future events. Inclusive Design 24 is brought to you with thanks to our supporters, Google, Intopia, Barrier Break, Tetralogical, Intuit, Infoaxia, and the Law Office of Laney Feingold. Inclusive Design 24 will be back on the hour with our next session. See you then.